You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore that air. I am broadcasting live, but kind of recorded from the Vivid Seats studio. Use promo code OVERTIME in the Vivid Seats mobile app to save up to $100 on all ticket purchases. First time customers only. So today I'm going to primarily focus on some of the questions and comments, but I did have a few other thoughts, and I also want to plug something. I mentioned the videos that I'm going to start making, uh, reviewing last week's game, and, and and whatever else. If you want to review the future opponent, however that might work, it's it's kind of just whatever. But in order to promote that, because I am really excited about it, I put up a video. You can see it at patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. I also put it on Twitter pack underscore daddy and i put it in the facebook group y- you got to go watch the video it's it's free and again it, it's it's meant to be a promotional tool but I'm, I'm i'm watching it a second time i almost didn't even get started on this podcast because it's like man i i gotta watch it's so much fun to watch these edge rushers holy cow that i picked the right the, the, the right group to watch in the first video i can say this with 100 percent confidence if if brian gutekunst does not get zadarius and preston we don't win that game and it's not even close the goal of the video was to essentially just record whenever they made a play. It was almost every play. You're basically watching every defensive snap. And the other interesting thing is um, there were periods when the edge rushers weren't exactly doing their best, right? Occasionally they lose and whatever. Those are the times when the Bears start to drive. There is a direct correlation between the the, the play of our edge rushers, primarily Preston and Zadarius, and the the Bears' success, but the video is about an hour long. Um, it's it's an hour long review of edge rushers. It's every single play uh, that in which they were either positive or negative. Almost all of them were positive. There were just like one or two negatives, and even the negatives, there was only one, or maybe again one or two that were actual negative negatives. Some of them were negatives, but kind of positives. So I I had a lot of fun making it. Uh, it took a long time, but. It's it's so much fun to watch, man. And if you're still hyped up on that and you just want to watch it again, I would encourage you to do it because it's going to get you even more jacked up than you already were. Because I'm I'm just blown away with with how impressive it was. Almost all the reviews obviously are Preston and Zadarius. There's one about Kyler and and I think two on Rashawn. And obviously you're going to get a little bit from some other players because you know it's a defensive play. But um, I you definitely got to go check it out. If you've got a little time, get it started, pause it, come back and watch it later. It's a must. And before we take our break, I just want to remind you, because I actually have to go lock in a couple things real quick, but do not forget that it is currently fantasy football season. And if you're looking to uh, play some daily fantasy sports, do not pass up on FanDuel. They've got more ways to win cash prizes and once-in-a-lifetime experiences during every single game, every single week than anybody else. And as a bonus, as I've mentioned, if you've never played FanDuel Fantasy Football before, there is a deal for new users. You get a $20 inside credit when you deposit $20. So it's a dollar-for-dollar match on a $20 deposit. I'm planning on doing some uh, previews probably tomorrow, looking at the games ahead. So we'll talk a little bit more in depth. But there is definitely a lot going on. There is a lot. uh, You know, it's it's actually a really good time of year to, to do this kind of stuff. 
because nobody really knows anything, at least in terms of lines being set really, really wonkily. And also a lot of people that haven't really been paying attention to football, making bets and, and playing da- daily fantasy and drafting people they never should. And you can kind of take advantage of those sorry people. But again, sign up for FanDuel right now. Get $20 in total bonuses. Just make your first deposit of $20 to get started, and you'll get an extra $5 in site credit every week for four weeks for a total of $20. Go to FanDuel.com slash DFS Fantasy or download the FanDuel app right now. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, That's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place. And you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular built for us. Terms apply. Awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. So I actually started recording this and then ran out of time. And, um... Not surprisingly, there was Antonio Brown news as I was out and about today. Um, Just because of the whole thing with me not knowing how to say his name properly and refusing to say it correctly and cringing every time I have to say it, he has decided that he is never going to be out of the news. Well, now he's officially off the team, and like clockwork now, uh, the question is arising, should the Packers pick him up? My answer before we realized he was a complete and total psychopath was no. My answer after realizing he is a complete and total psychopath is still no. Um, the fact that there is actually so much commotion, forget the Packers, there's so much commotion about where is he going to end, why do we think he's going anywhere? Am I the only one that just says, no, he's do- he's done, he is beyond done. There, I would be shocked if there's any team, including the Patriots or any other psychotic team, Jerry Jones kind of is out there a little bit, nobody, nobody, I would be stunned, beyond stunned if anybody is even considering it, even for a second, why would anybody consider that? And and the fact of the matter is there was very little interest. That was one of the shocking things is there was almost no interest. And then he goes to the Raiders for like a third and a fifth. And everyone's like, oh, it was a steal. I can't believe it. The Steelers got robbed. Th- there was almost no interest. And this is back when, remember, he was the victim. He's sitting out the rest of the season because Big Ben is a big meanie and his coach is taking Big Ben's side because he just cares about the quarterback and it's not fair and I'm being taken advantage of and I don't like it and I deserve more respect and blah, blah, blah. He has gone full crazy. And, and people are saying, well, the Patriots are going to pick. You think Bill Belichick's going to grab the guy that just secretly recorded his coach's phone conversation and posted it on social media? The guy that started a hissy fit and said, I'm not playing because I can't wear the helmet of my choosing. This guy breaks down under pressure, under structure. When there are rules, he breaks down. The more rules there are, the worse the situation is. And there are no teams that have more strict rules than the Patriots. That is the worst fit on planet Earth. I understand they do that whole thing where, oh, this guy's going to be cheap and he's really talented and he's going to come here and he's going to be... No, forget it. No. Bill Belichick has some semblance of pride and is not going to allow some punk spoiled brat like Antonio Brown come to this team and go strutting around acting like he's got something he is done and I'm I'm, I'm saying this not from a, a standpoint necessarily of authority because the way the news has been going it wouldn't even surprise me that much if somebody took a flyer on him but it would absolutely surprise me if somebody did and I, I would just I would I, I don't know I don't I don't know what took the Raiders so long to get rid of him He's a basket case. He's not going anywhere. He's done. If there if there is even a a, <laughs> a semi pro football team that picks him up, I'll be shocked. He's a he's a nutcase. I mean the the recording the phone call thing is legitimately scary. Like that freaked me out. And 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 think about this. He recorded this conversation. He goes and has it produced by some he paid big money. That was a big production. And it was kind of creepy, like a horror film, like some crazy, creepy stalker serial killer movie. As he's, he's like showing this creepy workout video 
with this privately th- recorded thing that nobody knew he was recording. But here's the other thing. He goes to the team and does this whole apology tour thing, all the while knowing he has this secretly recorded conversation that is currently in production to be released. And he's going, oh, I'm so sorry. And I, uh, and he knew this was going to happen. He's crazy. Why would anybody, nobody's going to touch him. No, forget it. Get it out of your head. Forget the Packers. It's, it's that that was never they they never considered him even before all this craziness zero chance zero chance think again I covered this several months ago but anybody that's new to the podcast welcome nice to see you zero chance they didn't want him before because if you think about what they did all last year Brian Gutekunst had a concerted effort to rebuild the locker room. The locker room was a serious problem. You look at the progress that was made in week one. You look at that team and how it worked as a unit. That is exactly the reason you cleanse the locker room and you work so hard to fortify the locker room. Think about how well everybody's getting along. Look at how well Rodgers is getting along with the coaches. Look how well everybody's getting along with everybody. You do not take Antonio Brown and drop him in the middle of this because he's a good wide receiver. Even though he's not going to play anyways, he's going to destroy your locker room. The whole team's going to fall apart. But man, oh man, he's going to be a thousand yard receiver with 15 touchdowns. I don't care. It's not worth it. He's going to ruin your team. And the only reason it ever worked with the Steelers is because the Steelers basically just treated him like a superstar diva and just like, whatever, just leave him alone. Let him do whatever he wants. And even that wasn't good enough for him. He's still throwing fits because, oh, I still want more. I want more. I want more. Big whiny baby. Get out of here. Take your bleach mustache and your nasty, scabby feet, and get out of here. Anyways, that's that's it, and I, I do not want to hear. I'm scared to even check my phone, because I guarantee there's some new Antonio Brown news here. There is a lot of extensions going on. Uh, Julio got $22 million, which doesn't seem like big news for us, other than when you consider the fact that Devontae Adams, within the next year or two, is probably going to be getting another contract with the Packers. $22 million is now the baseline. Meaning, even if Devontae isn't seen as being as good as Devontae, which, you know, we'll see what happens. Devontae's getting, or uh, Julio's getting up in age. I would be surprised if it's any less than $22 million a year. So, uh, Hecker just got a contract. Lots of stuff going on here. Anyways, that's enough for non-Packers, but kind of Packers news. I just, I needed to get that out because it's pretty big news. One, one thing that I, I kind of wanted to touch on that I never really considered is how easy it would have been how should I say this? How Im- impressed I am with the defense. And it, I, I said that. I have said that several times. But let's look at it from a different angle now. There really was no reason to expect even a good outing from the defense. And maybe you were expecting it, but l- let, me, let me phrase it a different way. If the defense was not great, how many legitimate excuses would we be laying out there right now? Probably a lot. In other words, a lot of excuses, and every single one of them would be pretty legitimate excuses. For the guys up front, we lost uh, um, Mike Daniels. That, that's a pretty big impact. That's going to hurt the pass rush. We replaced Mike Daniels with guys that legitimately just aren't quite as good as Mike Daniels. Preston Smith is, is pretty decent. Zadarius Smith is a good pass rusher, but not great against the run. Both of them are in a brand new scheme. Kevin King is injured and playing limited snaps. Tremont Williams is like 400 years old. Jair has not had a very good preseason. Blake Martinez is the only linebacker we have on the entire team, and he was the only linebacker that played at all on the entire team. Raven Green, if you think about it, if Raven Green had a terrible year this year, it would be one of those situations where I'm sitting there going, I'm such a dummy for thinking he was going to be good. Why would I think he's any good? He's an, he's an undrafted free agent who was not very good last year, who you know showed a couple flashy plays in preseason and training camp, which who cares, that doesn't mean anything, and then he had a bad day. Because, duh, because who cares? But by all accounts, he had a pretty good day. Darnell Savage has had very limited work. He's a raw rookie. Adrian Amos is brand new to the team, has never played with the Packers, and is learning a new scheme. There's no reason to believe these guys, who are a bunch of random people who just came together in one year, half of the team learning a new system, A good portion of the team being the first time ever setting foot on an NFL football field, Savage and and Rashawn, for example. Why would we expect that kind of an effort and an outing? I don't care who the offense was or how good Trubisky was. there There was no reason, even if this was December, that would be impressive. 
how in the world does that happen? I mean, that that's imp- I was impressed by the Bears, and we know the Bears are a good defense. But it's it's September. It's week one. Not everything's going to be perfect. Definitely something to be excited about. Now, uh, on the, on the flip side, which is going to get flipped again. If you look back at 2018 in week one, there was one team that held somebody to three points, and it was the Baltimore Ravens. Baltimore Ravens are a good team, and that's something to get excited about. But in week two, the Baltimore Ravens went up against the Cincinnati Bengals, a divisional opponent, and lost 34 to 23. They gave up three points, and then the next week gave up 34 points. So you know the the vigilance of of uh you know that adrian amos pointed to about week one doesn't matter you know it depends what you do beyond here and all that stuff that's true you know you got to do it again and again go watch that video that i made it it shows exactly and and i want to go look at corners and i think that's what i'm going to do next i really want to see corners i want to look at wide receivers because i'm worried about how that looked but i want to see the corners and then after that i want to see the safeties but again it, it really just comes down to making plays and, you know, even with the Bears, you know, the, the Vikings are going to be a better offense, but it just comes down to if you're not making plays, the offense is just going to march down the field. The Bears looked like they were about to, and then, you know, somebody made another play. Or there was just a series of, of plays where, you know, you got two, three guys making plays just long enough to to force a punt. Or you get a pick, or whatever. But, you know, if, if you go long enough without somebody making a play, or conversely having somebody give up a big play you know, corner busts the coverage or whatever, that's when the points start to rack up. So it's, it's really, and that, that's one of the things that makes a good defense. It's not just having elite talent in certain places. It's not just having good games. It's the consistency aspect of it. And that's part of why I think the whole defense wins championships moniker is true. It, it's about consistency. Good defenses are consistent. And when you get into the playoffs, you have to win X amount of games in a row. Teams with elite offenses and garbage defenses, there's so much fluctuation that, um, you know, if your if your offense has a down game, you're done. But either way, really good start. Let's uh let's turn our attention to a few questions. First question is from I'm not sure who. I don't have a name here, but question was just out of curiosity, who do you think was the most impressive in game one? Either of the Smiths, Adrian Amos or Savage. I haven't watched Amos or Savage yet, but having watched the edge rushers, it's gonna be one of those two for sure, and I stand by what I said. You you replace those guys, and without their consistent playmaking on literally every other play, somebody's making a play. Without that, it just doesn't work. It is actually a really good question though between the Smiths. It, it's probably gonna to have to be Zadarius. I love what Preston b- brings in terms of his ability to drop into coverage, which they did several times, which I'm sure has an effect. That Zadarius, you know, Zadarius is just a pure pass rusher. He's not a bad at anything else but he's not they're not even trying to drop him into coverage the versatility of preston smith is awesome how good he is against the run is awesome that the whole intelligence factor you know stop and 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 get your hand up you know if you're not going to get home get your hands up we saw all of it we saw him drop into coverage we saw him bat passes we saw great plays against the run we saw great pressure on the quarterback i really appreciate what preston smith did and it's possible he was he, he was the better guy there but it's hard to not go with zadarius with all the the pressure that he brought, the the power, the speed that you saw, the disruption, you know, I mean, he was he was getting double teamed on certain occasions, which was awesome. You know, there was one of the plays that I highlighted in the video um, where he's getting a double team, and it, it was my favorite play and is my favorite scene of the whole video. If you, it's about halfway through, but the uh, I'll just tell you about it. The alignment was Rashawn Gary, then Kenny Clark, then it was Zadarius, and then it was Preston. And essentially what you have is from left to right, Rashawn Gary is Rashawn Gary and Kenny Clark are both getting like one and a half teamed. In other words, it's kind of a double team on Kenny Clark, but the right guard is sort of kind of wanting to give a little bit of an extra hand to Rashawn Gary. And Rashawn Gary is just a bull and he's just plowing through. So the the right tackle can't handle it and he's starting to slip through. The right guard is is trying to focus on Kenny Clark, but now he's got this guy powering through Rashawn Gary. So he's got to turn his attention that way. On the other end of it, you've got sort of this that you got Preston Smith trying to go around the outside. Zadarius Smith is getting double teamed. Preston loops back around inside, and now you've got a situation where Rashawn Gary is taking. A, he 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 wasn't being double teamed, but he just basically plowed into two blockers and is now voluntarily giving himself up to two blockers and is sort of eating up three blockers. And Kenny Clark is looping around him because he's coming free. The guy that they're trying to double team is coming free. 
Preston is looping back around, and one of the guys who's double teaming Zadarius sees this and falls over trying to stop Preston. Now Zadarius has only got one guy blocking him, so he's ripping that guy's face off because you can't take him one on one. The freeze frames that I've had through this video where you see these offensive linemen just panicking and trying to go here, falling down, facing the complete wrong direction, it is mass chaos with that defensive front that you have under Mike Pettin. And it's it's just it's beauty. It's 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 chaotic beauty. And I, you know, I don't know if I really care to pick one or the other. Um Zadarius and Preston were unbelievable in this game. And and again, it's Yes, the, the 10 pressures from Zadarius is huge, but the versatility and all the little things, you know, the ability to drop into coverage, the, the, the greatness that he had in the run defense, you know, the, the one play in particular, he, he shut down single-handedly twice, actually, a run play. He was the only guy on the edge, and they had two guys pulling. The, the lead blocker pulls and tries to get him. He lowers his shoulder, hits the guy in the chest, launches him in the air, and basically just clogs up an entire offensive line leaving absolutely nowhere to go for the running back. Then the running back almost bounces it outside. Preston sheds a block and makes the tackle anyways. Just just absolutely phenomenal. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going with the Smiths and just saying that that duo was just so happy to see that. And I'm hoping to be just as excited watching the corners and watching the safeties. We'll get to that. Um, I can't wait. Uh, check from Chuck from Venice, Florida. I don't know if this was intended to be a question for the podcast or not, but I'll, I'll assume it was and read it. It says, it's funny how the corporate news media, a, you know, as it, for an example, Ryan Wood, can make a bad game prediction and still have a good excuse. Quote, nobody could have predicted this. Aren't sports writers supposed to have some keen insight? I got a good laugh out of that. I, I You don't really want guys, I guess, to be straight up shills, right? I'm, I'm, I label myself a fanalist, so I'm always going to lean Packers. And I've, I think even this year, it's going to be even more than, than usual just cause, cause why not? Right. In, in the CBS pool that I'm in, I'm going Packers across the board and it's working in my favor so far. It's going to be great when they go 16 and 0 and make it into the playoffs and go undefeated and win the Super Bowl. It's going to be great. However, I, I didn't hear or see Ryan Wood say this, but if he said nobody could have predicted this, that's kind of silly. That, that's a lame excuse. Just, just say that you thought the Bears were going to win, you were wrong, and it kind of stings a little bit because you bet against your team and your team won, which is fine. It happens a lot. Everybody that I listen to bet against the Packers. And again, I, I could sit here and take the credit for it, but I was more or less just doing it because it's the Packers. I'm guessing if I was an outsider looking in, I probably would have picked the Bears. But I'm not, so I didn't, and I was right, and they were wrong. But I, I will say nobody could have predicted this as silly. It wasn't that big of a, you know... I don't think there's that big of a difference, and I think there's plenty of reason to believe the Packers are the better team between the two. You know, the team with the better quarterback is pretty solid. you got a revamped defense. Week one, anything can happen. The idea that nobody could have predicted it, yeah, I don't know about that. Again, if he said that, that's that's silly. Uh, I had somebody else send me, it's it's not really a question, but they sent the video, and the video is going around everywhere, right? It's the it's the shot to MVS where it shows he's looking to his left, and he throws to his right and hits MVS, and it's sort of supposed to exonerate um, Aaron Rodgers with the whole notion that maybe he doesn't have the arm strength he used to. So I'm going to disagree on both accounts. I don't think he has a problem with arm strength, number one, or at least I don't necessarily believe that. I think the issues were mechanical. But I'm also not quite as impressed with this throw. The reason is, I, I don't think this is a no-look. I think he's following the receiver the whole way. If you look at where MVS is, he's on the left side, he's watching him, and then watch his head. His head slowly turns as MVS turns. He's basically staring the guy down. So his body is pointing the wrong way. His head has been following the whole time. So we can sit and be impressed with that. I'm not impressed because how about, can, look at the pocket he's in. He's got lots of time, no defenders near him. Turn your body, plant your feet, and throw a better pass. Don't lob the ball up in the air with some crazy, wicked sidearm throw because my body's still twisted the wrong way and whatever. It's just, I don't know. And maybe he was trying to... I, I just, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, it, it's cool, but again, I would rather you just turn your body a little bit and throw a better pass, as opposed to just keeping your body facing the wrong way, staring at him with your head and throwing from a really weird angle. And again, the, the ball just hung up there and it looked like it was just lobbed and didn't have the right strength and it should have been out further. And I, I just, you know, it, and that's the problem is the whole game was that way. Like, why are you doing this? Now, there's a lot of times when people are bearing down on you and you got a lot of pressure. It was brutal out there. I get that. But there were some, especially the throws in the flat, that were just inexcusable. And with this one, again, 
I'm not watching this and necessarily impressed. I kind of get it a little more, like, okay, maybe that's why. It would have been worse if he had a clean pocket, was, was set up correctly, staring right at the guy and still threw a bad pass. But I don't think there's necessarily a reason he couldn't have turned his body, other than he just felt a need to get it out urgently. But either way, again, I, I, if you just watch his head, his head is following him the whole time. So, I, I don't know. I'm, I mean, it's nothing to get upset about. I'm just, that's my opinion of that video. Everyone's freaking out like, this is the craziest video I've ever seen. It's a no-looker, 40 yards. It wasn't a no-looker. He's staring at him the whole time. And actually, his body is slightly, I'm watching it right now, his body is kind of turning, even in that direction. So his head is turning, his body is kind of turning, but his body doesn't quite get turned all the way. So he's definitely watching the guy. It's just, I don't know, he just trusts his body. And it works, so who cares? But still, it's... On a day when there were a lot of not great passes, it's little things like that that just kind of irk you. Like, come on, man. One good pass, please. Uh, I got another question. It might be the same phone number. It's not. Um, Another question. What looked more improved, the front seven or the secondary against the Bears? Again, I got to watch the secondary, but I would be stunned if it was better than the front. Um, I'm actually a little worried about watching the secondary because the front did so much. There's a part of me that worries that, first of all, Trubisky, we know, missed wide-open guys because you listen to the Bears fans saying they went and found all the the highlights. Like, look, he was open, and he was open, and he was open. And as much as they're frustrated with Trubisky, that tells me that we had guys that were not covering. On top of that, we had the front bailing out our corners. There was another, there's one in the video that I did that highlighted that, essentially saying, look, open guy here, open guy here, open guy here, but he can't throw. I think it was the exact same play that I was talking about with Kenny Clark charging at him from the front and he's like oh boy I gotta get out of here so I'm a little worried I I don't really have any reason to believe other than again it's very possible that with a combination of Trubisky not being a good quarterback missing throws not seeing open guys and our front getting to Trubisky and, and and you know disrupting his throws before he can get there I'm concerned that maybe the the secondary didn't quite do as well as we thought but again, I don't have any direct reason to say that. But I, I, I am fairly confident that the front seven was better than... Um, and, and front seven means, I guess, Blake too, which is fine. I think Kenny did fine. But it, it really was just the edge rushers, which is awesome. You know, Ken, Kenny had some impact. I know Dean had it smoked a guy and, and broke up a pass. That's in the video as well. Only because he came in as a result of Zadarius making him step up, and he stepped right up into Dean Lowry and just got smoked. Just just watching him get hit over and over again and getting picked up, and the freeze frames of him just getting absolutely obliterated, that was so much fun to watch that. But anyways, that, that is my... It was the front. It was definitely the front, in my opinion, but um, I'll let you know if I change my mind after watching the secondary. Uh, switching over to voicemail now. Um, some of these are a little bit dated, but if it's still somewhat relevant, I'll, I'll go ahead and look at it. Uh, Nate from Wisconsin Rapids was asking about the running backs. He said the injuries are somewhat of a concern and uh, also pointed out that if in the 2020 draft we decide to move on, it would give our coach an opportunity to get somebody that actually fits his scheme, not to say that the guys that we have don't, but that's something that, you know, getting the right offensive linemen, the right running backs, you know, same with Petten, right? Petten, not that the guys that we have are incompetent, but Mike Daniels is a great example. He's a good football player. It's not what he's looking for. And so it's something to talk about. I know this isn't probably the right time, but again, my timing is a little bit off, and it is a valid question. Um, I would say if there's an injury to Aaron Jones, and I saw he did get hurt, as far as I know, he's okay, he hurt his finger, whatever it was, I don't have any idea. But if there is a significant injury, I would say that there is definitely a need for a running back. If there is not any real injuries, and he has a great year, maybe we don't go that route. Anything in between, I would say that there's probably going to be at least one. Um, he asked the question of who do you think is somebody that we should be looking at and maybe when that's a tough question um, because typically the the Packers you're looking at is similar to linebacker and everything else where you say it's probably not going to be until the fourth round Um, and also teams in general don't want to take running backs early and you figure the Packers are some of the more conservative teams that are probably not going to do it but I don't know man I you know if Matt LaFleur went to Brian Gutekunst and said you don't understand the running back is a very very important position I would like to get somebody that's super dominant. And you get a Travis Etienne that's available at the end of the first or a Jonathan Taylor that's available at the end of the first. I, I don't know. I, I You know, 
even even with again with the injuries and the wear and tear, I mean, running backs are something that you just kind of cycle through. You you want to have a, a fresh hand ready to go. You don't really want to get into a Todd Gurley situation or a Melvin Gordon situation or Ezekiel Elliott situation, where you got the 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 wear and tear on top of they want ten, twelve, fifteen million dollars. It's like yeah, I don't know about all that. Uh, there there are we'll take a minute on this. I know probably a lot of people aren't super interested, but I like the draft a lot, so let's look at it. We know a couple things. We we know that there's a demographic that the Packers seem to like. I don't think they're as interested in in receiving backs. It just as much as it seems to make sense, and we know that they want guys that can catch the ball. They they just don't. In other words, the priorities are such that we want the guys that we want, and we want those guys to catch the pat the ball. It's not the other way around where we want guys that can catch the ball. No, no, no. We want these guys. And of these guys, we expect you to catch the ball. And if you can't, that's frustrating. But I'm not going to go out and get a guy that just catches footballs. That's not going to work. Now, Travis Etienne and Jonathan Taylor both have giant questions as far as being receivers. I don't think they care. I think it's one of those situations where, well, we're going to get them in. We're going to put them on the jugs machine. We're going to tell them you need to catch, you need to catch, you need to catch. And if it doesn't work out, I don't really care. Just run the football. The other thing that we know, uh, outside of wanting sort of bigger backs, you know, the, you look at Travis Etienne, 5'10", 215, that works, right? That, that's, that fits the profile. The other thing, though, outside zone. Fortunately, PFF did release their summer grades, and they do have uh, zone and man grades. So some of the guys, uh, for example, Etienne, not bad, 84-7, but he's a better man runner, which is to say he's more of a Leonard Fournette between the tackles guy. One of the highest zone grades is Zach Moss out of Utah, 5'10", 222. I mean, that fits the prototype absolutely perfectly. Unfortunately, horrific receiving grade. I mean, real bad. Again, do we care? I don't know, but that's that's an issue. Uh, another guy, Eno Benjamin, 91.6 zone grade. In other words, he's terrible between the tackles, his man grade, or I shouldn't even say between the tackles. That's not necessarily how that works. There's, there's zone blocking and man blocking. But as far as his ability, you know, it's that one cut and go. 91.6 is one of the highest zone grades that I've seen. And he's also got a decent receiving grade. It's not great, but it's above average. So if you want to look at somebody, Eno Benjamin, the problem is five foot ten, 201 pounds. He's small, and they don't want small guys, right? They're, they're worried about these guys breaking down. So Zach Moss makes sense. I think Eno Benjamin, to an extent, makes sense. There's other guys that... that that can work just fine. DeAndre Swift is a phenomenal receiver and is decent enough. I mean, he is a zone runner. He doesn't do any uh, power man blocking for at Georgia. It's all zone. So he could be a, a pretty good fit, and he's, he's super hyped up. Um, again, as a receiver, he's awesome. 5'9", 215 is a little bit small, but, you know, whatever. Bottom line is there, there's plenty of guys, and I mentioned Jonathan Taylor. He's another guy that fits the prototype. Um, where did he go? Here he is. Jonathan Taylor is... 5'11", 219. He fits that prototype perfectly. Unbelievable runner. Um, his overall rushing grade that they gave him was a 91.4 elite running grade. A little bit better as far as man blocking than zone blocking, but still um, both of those things are very, very good. Short yardage get grade is awesome. Receiving grade is abysmal. He's just, he can't do it. And then yards after catch per attempt which means almost nothing because he hardly ever touches the ball, is also pretty solid. So there, there's a lot of options, but to your larger question of would they do it, I think so. I think even if things go fairly well, I, I think you just you just grab one if you can. Uh, the, they're not going to not do it. It's just a matter of are they going to specifically try to do it and how desperate are they going to be to make sure that they do it. And I do think it's going to be on the list. It's just a matter of how high of a priority is it going to be and uh, the other question would be, let's just say best player ab- available is a running back. Let's say, you know, we're, we're picking at, I don't know, 32 and ETN slides because he can't catch. Or DeAndre Swift is at, is at 32. Would they be willing to pull the trigger, right? He's best man available, but do you really want to, w- would they be willing to do that? And again, the, the importance of the run game, we've already seen the revamping a little bit of the offensive line. Um, would, would they pull the trigger on a running back? I think it's possible. Uh, the final uh, voicemail I'm going to have, Andy, I apologize. You've got two of them that I didn't get to fast enough. One of them is a practice squad question, and one of them is uh, about Andrew Luck. Um, so I really appreciate you calling, but uh, it's it's not really where we're at right now. Um, but the, the final voicemail comes uh, by way of Jim from Florida, and he brings up a, a fantastic point, and I actually meant to get to it. Um, Because yesterday I had started off the podcast just very briefly talking about some of the things I'm concerned on. And I touched a little bit on, you know, again, how Aaron Rodgers and his passes weren't all that great. And 
And and the the biggest problem is there's, there's plenty of excuses and they're good excuses and it's it's not a reason to super panic yet, but it just kind of gets to the feeling like you know man there's, there's always a new excuse there's always a new reason, but the biggest thing and this is exactly what Jim was saying, is uh, above anything else as silly as it sounds the one thing that gives me confidence and I agree with Jim on this, is how happy Aaron Rodgers is, and I, and I know that sounds weird. But if you remember, if you've been listening a while, it was several months ago I had made the comment that Aaron Rodgers is a wide-open book. And he doesn't predict the future. He doesn't make things happen necessarily with his words. He just tells us what's going on. And last year, the biggest difference between last year when the offense didn't look good and this year when the offense didn't look good is Aaron Rodgers. And that sounds weird because Aaron Rodgers is what doesn't look good right now. But if you remember last year, how it started, even throughout training camp, getting mad at the wide receivers. There were rumors about him getting mad at the wide receivers coach and telling him, just don't listen to that guy, whatever. And I don't know how much of that stuff is true, but there was no question. And just the the last press conference I saw with Aaron Rodgers, he looked, I mean, he just looked like he was on cloud nine. And I know they just won the game, but st- I mean, th- there were times when the Packers won the game and McCarthy and Rodgers both looked like they just sat on attack. I mean, he he just genuinely looks happy. I mean, he, you know, when the questions come in, a lot of times you're kind of trying to read the, the the person, and as the question goes on, you just the player looks frustrated, and you know, like they don't like the questions. He looks so happy that the questions were asked. And he's like, "Oh yeah, that's a great question," and "Oh, definitely," and this and that, and he is just genuinely happy. And maybe it's non-football stuff that he's happy about, but. Again, it seems like, and I, I mentioned this all last year, one of the things I was upset about is you never see the excitement. When, when guys go out and play, they score a touchdown, they go sit on the sideline, they don't talk to each other. When things are bad, they walk past each other. You know, you get scrunch face from Mr. Scrunch Face, Mike McCarthy, who gives you that look just where he twists his face all up like, what are you doing, dummy? And then he just goes about his business and everyone just sits and everybody just pouts and nobody talks, nobody high fives, nobody's jumping up and down. And that stuff matters, and, and, and the fact of the matter is it's going on again. And again, Aaron Rodgers is an open book. If things aren't going well, he's going to say something. If he's legitimately concerned and his wide receivers are straight trash or, or Lafleur's play calling is really garbage and he was worried, it would show through, and he wouldn't be so happy, and he wouldn't be giving Lafleur the game ball. And, and the, the idea that, and the only reason I mention this is because the idea pops into my head too, that this is all for show and he's just trying to prove the media wrong, and he doesn't do that. We learned last year he's beyond that. When he doesn't like something, he's just going to come out and say it. He's not even passive-aggressive anymore. He's just straight-up aggressive. He's just going to say, I don't like this. So when he gives the head coach a game ball, it's because he wants to. When he goes over and just m- absolutely mugs the defensive coordinator because he's super excited, when, when he cannot stop smiling and talking about the defense because he knows this is for real, it's for real. And when he says, I'm going to get better, you know what? He's going to get better. He understands, and, and he gets it, and, and, you know, last year he was mad, he was angry because he saw the problems and they were not getting fixed. This year, the things are bad, and he's in a great mood. Again, it sounds weird, and it's a weird thing to, to lay your money down on and, and to have an opinion on, but it's absolutely true, and, and he knows, right? Run the table. What is run the table? He didn't say it and make it happen. He's just telling us, listen, you don't understand. I know it looks bad, but you don't see what I see. We are right there. It's so close, and actually at the end of that game that we lost, something happened, and everything clicked, and I'm telling you, we can run the table. It was a ridiculous statement at the time, because the Packers were terrible, and they had a tough slate coming up. Guess what? They ran the table, because Aaron Rodgers knew what was going on. He understood what needed to happen, and he understood they weren't there yet, and he also understood at the last half of that game, it happened. We got it. It clicked. The relaxed statement, it, It's again, he didn't say it, and then it just you know, magic happened all around him. He's saying relax because he understood, not that he necessarily knew it was going to get better, but he understood that the problems that were ahead of him are normal and natural and they'll get better. It's going to be fine. That everybody else was being ridiculous. And, and from our standpoint, it's okay to be a little bit ridiculous because we don't have control like Aaron Rodgers has control. We can't see what he sees. and we don't, we don't hold the ball. We don't touch the ball. We don't make the decisions. Everything's wildly out of our control and it makes us nervous. But when the guy who's in there, who's doing it, is saying everything's fine, everything's going to get better. I'm I'm a little bit rusty. I got stuff to learn. I got you know this, that, and the other thing. I I genuinely believe it, and I I wouldn't just believe it if he had said it differently. You know, if if he was in a bad mood and he goes up to the podium and people are calling him out on it, 
and he gets up there and throws a little fit, and he's like, you know, I mean, it's 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 week one. What do you want from me? And he's got an attitude. I'm not going to feel as good about that. I mean, he had the look of a guy that's like, this is it. This is what I've been begging for. This is the deep. We're going to win. We're going to win the Super Bowl. This is going to happen. He didn't say it, but it was all over his face. Like, finally, this is this is what we've always needed. This is the team I've always wanted. Him trying to get that smile off his face when he was talking about the defense and just couldn't. There's reason for optimism. There's reason for pessimism, but there's a lot of reason for optimism. And I, I think, as, as Jim alluded to in his question, which I don't even know if it was a question. I think he was just making a statement, but I, I agree with it. That gives me hope more than anything else. So let's take a quick break, and then I'm going to turn to the Facebook group and see what we got in there, and uh, we'll call it for the day. So we'll start with a prediction from Jacob because, you know, he had a good prediction, came true, so might as well give the guy some love. He says, here's my hot take. Call it dumb or wishful thinking, and I know the odds are not the greatest, but I think there's a real possibility we run train on the Bears Thursday. Should just end it there, but um, we'll keep going. People are focused on their D, new coach and system. Like Ryan said, they almost have to regress, and I think it's going to be more substantial. Now, I'm going to pause there because there's a lot of talk about, see, they didn't regress and everything's, we'll see. The pass rush is scary. That's going to be hard to defend. We don't really know what's going to happen in terms of their coverage unit. I still want to see, I, I never said they were going to be bad, and, and Jacob isn't saying they're going to be bad. I want to see if they're going to be the number one defense, if they're going to be a top five defense, or if they're going to be outside of the top five. We don't know the answer to that yet. My thought is outside of the top five, we'll see. Continuing on now. Also, they focus on the fact Rodgers hasn't played in preseason. Well, old Mitchie T has played three snaps, all handoffs. I'll take a cold Rodgers over a cold Mitch any day, and from all accounts, he looks horrible in practice. Is absolutely correct. With the exception of potentially him saying there was a regression on the, the Bears' defense, he nailed this prediction 100%. And actually, it's 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 kind of interesting thinking back, because really, the who wins this game come, comes down to which quarterback, which offense, which offensive coordinator, head coach, whatever, can orchestrate one drive? The answer to that question is Aaron Rodgers and the Packers. They orchestrated one drive, and that won the game. A cold Rodgers was better than a cold Trubisky, and that's what won the game. So, well done, sir. A uh, comment from Chris. Uh, he complimented the podcast and then went on to say, To add to what you were saying about Mitch, last season the Bears rarely fell behind against teams. Nagy's hands were never really forced to be one-dimensional, i.e. force Mitch to come from behind and win a game. I think we win comfortably tomorrow, and the Green Bay narrative switches from audible talk to how dangerous can this Packers team be this season. It was another really good prediction because essentially that is what the Bears needed to do. Now, it wasn't because the Packers offense took off. But at the end of the day, it came down to Trubisky needs to step up and, and win the game, and he just he just couldn't do it. Now, I'll, I'll be honest. Well, two things are true here. Chris is absolutely correct. The, the Bears can't win that way. Trubisky is not the guy you need to come from behind. However, he can do it sometimes. He, he's one of those weird guys where, it's similar to Cutler in a way, where you, or, or Stafford for that matter, he's not a good quarterback, but I'm always scared of him every time we play him. And I think that's how it's going to be with Trubisky until they eventually dump him where he's not a good quarterback and you know it's most likely going to be a good day, but he has some days where he just goes off and he throws some amazing passes and it doesn't take much. You know, if if he sees an open guy, it could be a 50-yard pass, you know, and another couple breaks here and there and it's it's a touchdown, it's a tie game. But uh, yeah, he was absolutely right that this is going to be a problem for them is the offense is going to need to be able to be better than that. Because if, if teams can find a way to overcome that defense, rack up a few points. I mean, if, if it's to the point where 17, 18 points is enough to win, the Bears are done. That's too much for a defense. No matter how good you are, you, you got to be able to at least put up 20 points in a game. If I can't put a, count on you to get up to 20, I, we're, we're going to be in, in big trouble. Uh, Dustin says, defense won us a game for once. That's a good step in the right direction. Um, kind of a self-evident statement, but it, it kind of a segue into... I think the Packers' season goes one of a couple different ways. But if the defense stays the same, and this is kind of goes without saying, but it, it's it's going to feel good to say it. If the offense doesn't improve, it's not going to be a very good team. If the offense can get back to being pretty good, in other words, get back to being Aaron Rodgers even dragging an offense, which is good enough to be a top 10 you I mean, let, let me put it, if the offense is top 10 and the defense stays about that good, this is going to be the best team in the NFL. No, that's a tall order because sustaining that, that level of success on defense and being a top-ten offense is, is a, a, a tough thing to do. 
But uh, one week down, and plenty of reason to believe the offense is going to improve. They're on their way, man. And I, I shouldn't even say this because people aren't going to want to hear it, but this is a rebuild. And this may very well be a one-year rebuild where this is the team. If this isn't the team and we get to the playoffs and don't we get a Super Bowl or what, whatever the case may be, 2020 is going to come one way or another. We're either going to win the Super Bowl or not. This is just a reality of life. But the fact of the matter is this was done essentially in one year for Brian Gutekunst. Two technically, but this was the big year. You know, you got a defensive coordinator who's going to tell you what he needs on defense and look what happened. Now next year, you got Matt LaFleur telling Gutekunst, this is what I need on offense. And if he's able to execute in the same kind of a way to get the right kind of guys to do that, I, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I guess what I'm excited about is not only the potential of this year, but the potential of the next two, three, four, five years for this team. Because remember, what I had said about Brian Gutekunst is his, he has got so much on the line here. Because if Preston is no good, if Sidarius is no good, if Rashawn is no good, if Savage is no good, if Billy Turner is no good, if, if these guys that he went out and got and locked us into for several years, because these are young guys. These guys are meant to come in and build for the future. These guys are going to be here for the long haul. If this is no good, if this doesn't work, if this defense doesn't work, we're, we're sunk. On the flip side, if it works, which it seems to be working pretty well, we're locked up for several years. This could be several years of good defense. If we draft or or acquire nobody else, we've got several years of a pretty good defense. And then next year we come by and get what? Get, get lock up Devontae, grab him a number number two wide receiver, a running back in the third, improve the offensive line. I'm telling you, man, this this team is is it's built the right way, and it's 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 about to be scary. One of my favorite questions, Jeffrey says. So Ryan, how good is Mitchell Trubisky? <laughs> I'll never miss an opportunity to talk trash about Mitch Trubisky. That's just something I will never pass up. But I actually didn't do it uh, when I did the review, so let's talk about it. He was the third lowest graded offensive player on their entire team. Tight end Bradley Sowell, who only played seven snaps and doesn't really count, uh, would be the second worst. Taylor Gabriel was dead last of this list. All three of those guys were very close. Um, Only three players were below, below average, meaning they were bad, and Mitch Trubisky was one of them. As far as how it compares to previous weeks, years, whatever, this is, uh, last year he had three games that were worse than this performance, believe it or not. Uh, Week two against Seattle was about the same. It was, it was real bad. Um, Week 14 against uh, Louisiana, or uh, Louisiana, geez, LA Rams was slightly worse. Week nine against Buffalo, and then week three against Arizona. Otherwise, this was one of his worst, but Fortunately for all of us, no reason to believe he can't replicate that level of garbage. And as for 2017, again, as I've said, everyone talks about how much better he got from 2017 to 2018. He didn't have a single game in 2017 that was graded lower than what he did in week one, and he had several in 2018 that were worse. From what I can tell, he's in his third year of regression. 2017, the stats weren't as good, but he was graded out pretty much average to good to a little bit higher than that the entire season. 2018 rolls around, he had a couple real good games, a lot of real, real trash games. And 2019, so far, he started off with uh, being just completely horrible. So, as I said, he's in his third year of regression, to answer your question. Got another prediction here from Kyle. I'm trying to be nice and not go back and read bad predictions, but Kyle did say Green Bay would win. The score was a little bit off, 35-14. to 14. But maybe that's next week. You're 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 kind of like me. I'm about a year ahead on all my predictions. Maybe you're about a week ahead. So next week we can look forward to 35-14. Uh, way too high on passing and rushing yards. However, he predicted the defense had four sacks and two turnovers. I would say going into this, that was the most bold prediction of the group, and pretty close. So well done. You got the things that matter right. The the sacks, and the fact that we won. So I'm calling that a win. We got uh, three observations from Kona here. Number one is the speed from Savage was really evident. I agree. Not a lot to elaborate on there, but um, I I can't wait to go back and watch him. His second point, he said that he he feels that the tackling was a lot better. I absolutely agree. There were some some missed tackles. There were some that that weren't great, but overall, the defense did a good job of getting people down, right? There's a difference between missed tackles and what we saw on Thursday and missed tackles compared to what we've seen in the past where... You know, this is a guy who just can't quite bring him down, and then the second guy and the third guy and the fourth guy come, and they get the man down. And, and for the most part, the tackling was on point. Um, whereas in the past, you get one guy there, he misses the tackle, and then the guy runs for 15 yards. Big difference. 
Now, the overall tackling grade wasn't great, and again, it's because of all the missed tackles. Uh, they had a 58.7 grade. The Bears had a 57, so they weren't great either. In terms of actual statistics, they had a, the Packers down for 41 tackles and 7 misses. I think I ran through it, but it's Jair, Darnell Savage, Kevin King, Dean Lowry, Blake Martinez, Zadarius Smith, and Preston Smith all registered one missed tackle. So again, not the end of the world. Almost all of these tackles got cleaned up by somebody right behind them, but um, all of those guys registered negative tackling grades. Still something that could be a little bit better, and if it does, it's just going to make this defense even nastier, but I thought it was a pretty good effort as well. And then his third point uh, from Kona is he loved how much the tight ends were put in the picture. I absolutely agree. We kept, we've kept we been hearing for years from Mike McCarthy how much he loves tight ends, how much he wants to utilize tight ends, and just never really did. And um, here we got to see a little little taste of it. And it was a little bit of everything. And I liked Mercedes getting mixed in uh, because, as I said, he's a real good blocker, so it, it really fits in with the whole, um, you know, you're not sure what they're going to do. You assume he's in there to block, but when he slips out, now you got a problem. But uh, we saw him, we saw Jimmy, we saw Tanyan, and I think that's just going to continue to grow as time goes on. And overall, he gave it a 5 out of 7, and he used the fire symbol because he likes to make me insane. Uh, Jason uh, brought up a really good point here as well in the Facebook group. Be sure to get in the Facebook group. He said, reading and listening to a lot of material this morning and people dogging Lafleur hard uh, for his offensive pass interference challenge, I think it was good time for a timeout anyways they were getting quite the momentum going and just moving down the field at that point so why not take a shot at the challenge this has been brought up by a few other people and actually the my buddy who i was watching the game with brought it up um as we were watching it it makes perfect sense the the bears had some fantastic momentum and if i'm not mistaken immediately after this was the first and 40 it was penalty after penalty after penalty they couldn't get back into the swing of things and there's some people talking about maybe this is going to ruin the game or this is going to mess everything up because you're going to see this where people are going to start challenging this stuff just to break up momentum maybe i don't know uh it's, it's kind of a lot to risk and lose and throw away a timeout uh, although teams take timeouts anyways this is essentially just a really long timeout to break it up so i i don't know we'll see what happens but either way, I think you're right. I, I, I don't know if it was intentional, but um, it, it ended up working out perfectly. Uh, Brandon had a couple observations from the defensive backs. He said, number one, Amos is the free safety. Savage is a strong safety. Number two, why is Tony Brown playing over Josh Jackson? I don't have an answer to number two other than Josh, Josh Jackson just is not developed quite yet. Um, I agree. Robinson killed him. I think he would have killed Josh Jackson as well. The, the bigger question is why is why is either of these players why is not our best guy on that? But they, things just get rotated, things get mixed up. It depends on the play call, it depends on the situation. Occasionally, you get somebody lined up against somebody that can't quite hang. You just got to expect the guy. Listen, I know it's an unfair matchup, but you got to do your job. Now, on the other point about Amos and Savage. PFF does break guys down by position, and it's a little bit wonky because they don't just say free safety, strong safety, whatever. They're actually much more specific, and I did think that it was a little bit interesting. So if we don't get into the detailed positions, they have it broken down. Essentially, he was inside the box, seven plays. He played in the slot 37 times, which is huge, and I did not realize that. And he played free safety 25 times. Now, the way that they break this down is strong safety, they put under box. So according to them, he played as a strong safety six times. He played as a free safety 25 times. Now, where you put that, you know, it's actually a little bit subjective because they're kind of standing in, in, you know, not clearly defined places. You might look at it and say he's playing strong there. Maybe Amos is back a little bit, but... Based on, you know, it, it depends how many yards from the line of scrimmage they are. That's what PFF is using, and they're saying basically he's a free safety even if he's up a little bit closer. Amos was broken down six plays in the slot, 15 plays in the box. Um, some of those played at linebacker. Again, left linebacker, right linebacker, strong safety, strong safety, left, strong safety, right. Those are all the differentiating factors they have. Just sa- strong safety, he was in four times. At linebacker, he was in 11 times. Uh, Again, slot six times, free safety 46 times. So both of them played free safety most of the time. Darnell Savage played a lot of slot corner. Neither of them really played a whole lot of strong safety. Um, But uh, Darnell Savage did play more in the box than Adrian Amos did, especially if we're talking strong safety. Most of the time when Adrian Amos was in the box, he was essentially playing as the third or as the, the 
dime linebacker, essentially. So that is something else we can look at, too, is um, where people lined up. I do think that that's pretty interesting. I want to go through the defensive line. We're not going to do that today because we're actually pretty close to just about out of time. In fact, I think I am just going to stop there. If we got more, we can always do it tomorrow. But anyways, complete grab bag. I have no idea what I'm going to title this podcast, but you folks have yourselves a fantastic day. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.